Welcome to today's annual member meeting. A few reminders before we get started. During this meeting, uh, the Zoom chat feature is available to post your questions or comments. This call is being recorded and will be shared publicly on our website afterwards. If you have any technical issues during today's call, please use the chat function or reach out to webinars at cof.org. We have an automated live transcript available if you select at the bottom of your screen to show subtitles or view full transcript. Thank you again for joining us today. At this time, I will hand it over to Tanya Allen. Thank you so much, Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Allen, President and CEO of the McKnight Foundation and Chair of the Council on Foundations. I want to welcome every single one of you to the Council's annual membership meeting. Thank you for joining us virtually. Our annual meeting is always a great opportunity to check in on the state of the Council on Foundations as an organization and the power of our collective platform and network as a group of philanthropic organizations aiming to do good in the world. It is a wonderful opportunity to also celebrate excellence and impact in the field. So we're excited to get through some of our um, business um, to conduct the council's annual end of year business in today's meeting, including our re-election of board members, the treasurer's report, as well as remarks by our brilliant and principal president and CEO, Kathleen Enright. We're even more thrilled to recognize our 2022 award winners. This includes an award for the first ever Corporate Grant Making Award, as well as the Scrivener Award for Creative Grant Making and the Distinguished Service Award. The winner um, of the 2022 Distinguished Service Award is Charles Anderson. Charles will be in dialogue with our board member, Brennan Gold, to reflect on his illustrious career of service to his community. So let's get started through this business so that we can get to Charles' presentation and conversation. So prior to the meeting, uh, the membership, that means you, received email communication about the slate of board members and minutes from the 2021 meeting. Voting members of the council were able to submit proxy votes, enabling members of the executive committee to vote on their behalf to confirm board nominees. Council staff, in consultation with Brennan, the board secretary, verified that a quorum was present for this meeting. I'd like to ask the executive committee members to unmute themselves and I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the 2021 membership meeting. So moved. Thank you, Peter. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Juan. I, I will call for the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so that was unanimous. I don't need to ask for uh, any dissent. <laughs> <laughs> Since the end of 2021, the council has welcomed 120 new members and our community now includes 848 members. These members represent the diversity of our sector with community foundations, private foundations, corporate philanthropy, grant making public charities, as well as our non-US members and other um, categories of membership that you see on the screen. We're excited to continue serving our members while welcoming newer colleagues into the fold. Members can access a directory of their fellow membership or fellow members on the council's website. The council has had a very busy year uh, on many fronts, but one activity in particular that I wanna highlight is the work of the ethics task force. This task force, which was uh, chaired by Jamie Marisotis from the Lumina Foundation, um, convened at the beginning of the year and updated the set of ethical principles that the council members agreed to uphold during their membership. The task force also proposed a sanction process for members who violate these ethical principles. 
The task force has made great progress in the past year, and I am so grateful to this committee of five for approaching this work with, the, with such care and consideration that it requires. The council's team will share the final ethics principles and sanction process in early 2023. This work, as you all know, is about preserving the integrity of our field of philanthropy, as well as our institution as a collect, our, our ability to serve as a collective platform on behalf of the philanthropic sector. Now, I'd love to pass it to my colleague, Peter Logan, who's the vice chair of the council's board, as well uh, as the president of the Hilton Foundation. So, um, Peter, can you? begin and give us an update on our current slate. Sure, Tanya, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. As Tanya says, my name is Peter Lawhorn. I'm the vice chair of the board and also chair of the governance committee. And uh, one of the main responsibilities of the governance committee is the recruitment of new members for the council's board of directors. But during two, 2022, we had 17 members and only two board members set to end their terms this year. Because this still leaves our board at an ample size of 15 members, the governance committee decided not to actively recruit this year. But looking ahead to 2023, we're looking forward to recruiting several new board members and bringing nominees to the membership at the next member meeting. We do have three candidates who are renominated for a second three-year term, which we shared with the membership along with notice for this meeting. Uh, these candidates are Brennan Gould, President and CEO of the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation and Secretary of the Board, Mei Hong, Vice President of the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, and myself, Peter Lawhorn, President and CEO of the Conrad and Hilton Foundation and Vice Chair of the Board. So with that, uh, let me turn it back to you, Tanya, to ask for a vote on the proposed slate. Thank you, Peter, for that update. So we have uh, an unusual position where we have two sitting board officers who are up for re-election this year. And I wanna clarify um, a process point that I think it'll make sure it gives everyone comfort that we are voting on a proxy vote. And the board officers today, when they vote, they're voting representing the proxy vote of the membership. So we received a number of proxy forms submitted by the members. They and, and so our board members will not be voting in their own voices as individuals, but actually representing the membership's vote who has already submitted their um, uh, their uh, support of the proposed candidates. So per our bylaws and usual procedure, the full board approved this nomination slate at our last meeting. So the two officers for re-election are not recusing themselves as they are acting as executive committee members who are voting as the representatives of the member who submitted proxy votes, as I stated before. Now for the proxy vote itself, I will ask the other members of the council executive committee, Peter, Brennan, and Juan, to unmute yourselves and prepare to vote on the candidates. All right, so we have a, an active motion. I'd like to call, well, let me let me ask for an active motion. So moved. Thank you, Juan. May I ask for support? Second. Thank you, Brennan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Since we got a unanimous vote, there is no opposition. So thank you so much. Now I'm gonna, I have the great pleasure of turning it to our treasurer, Juan Martinez, who will now share the treasurer's report on behalf of the council. Juan. Thank you very much, Tanya. And uh, it's, it's, always, it's always pleasurable to have a good report. So this is a good, this is a, 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 a truly a pleasure. Um, as we reported last year, uh, the council has reached a comfortable place of financial stability. Uh, and we're pleased that it has continued throughout uh, 2022, even with uh, greater economic uncertainty. We continue to maintain uh, sufficient board designated reserve, which sits at $4.9 million today as, uh, as of our more, most recent financials and our assets and liabilities uh, both remain in very good position. Our strong financials have allowed us to continually grow the breadth of the council's offerings 
and the council staff who develop and deliver these programs after a busy year of recruiting are ending at very near, nearly full uh, staff capacity of 49. As will be the case in 2023, the council fundraised for strategic projects and generated operating uh, general operating support. And we received a clean uh, audit in the, uh, for the 2021 fiscal year. The detailed audited financials are available on the council's website. Uh, from a membership perspective, the council has seen a steady renewal rate of our members and our membership totals uh, continue to grow. We're grateful for the loyalty of our members and look forward to providing the resources and programs they need in 2023. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, I, or actually uh, with that, Kathleen, uh, I, I uh, cede to you. Well, thank you, Juan. That's terrific. I appreciate you very much, um, not only for that report, but for your two years of leadership as treasurer. Um, you have guided us ably, and I have learned a lot from you. So thank you so much. Um, now it is my pleasure to share with you, our members, just some highlights of our work over the past year. As you well know, we exist so that philanthropy continues to be trusted partners in advancing the greater good. And we want to help each of you strengthen your own practice uh, so that you can better serve your stakeholders and your mission. Now, the council is our members. There isn't any separation there. And those of us who are lucky enough to serve on the uh, staff of the council or on the board of the council, we care deeply about your success. And we hope that we express that care through our actions every single day. You know, we see you working tirelessly to improve your communities, to make your work better for your for the nonprofits that you fund and that you serve, and for those who carry an undue burden um, in their own lives. So we want to make sure that we can be there for you. And we do that in big and small ways. So I just want to describe a couple of those, you know, for CEOs, sometimes that role can be pretty isolating. So we have set up a lot of different circumstances where we um, can provide a sense of support for the CEOs amongst our members. You're often serving as a bridge between your board and your staff. You're often making tough calls. Um, so we have uh, set up some, some places, some spaces where you can find those who are facing similar, similar, similar challenges to you um, where you can possibly find some support. This is also why we are focused on leadership development and talent development, because we care about all the members of the teams inside our, our, found, our, our member foundations, and particularly um, to diversify the folks who are inside philanthropy. So Career Pathways, uh, our Career Pathways program is a priority and will always be in our Career Pathways current um, cohort and our alumni are among uh, the most important folks in our network, and they are some of the finest professionals in the field. So um, we are always going to be leaning in and supporting them in whatever way that we can um, over the course of, of their journeys. You know, the council also cares about the institutions that make up our members, not just the people, which is why our legal team stands ready to help manage risk with you, to help answer any questions that arise when things get complicated in your work. And we know that that sometimes happens. Um, it's also why our government affairs team is always monitoring what's going on in Congress and in the administration to ensure that you have access to what the latest is um, that you need to know on issues that matter. And so that you can inform your board or that you can just make sure that you're tapping in to um, any resources that might come available. Finally, we know that no successful organization operates in a vacuum. So the council cares a lot about the greater system in which we're all operating. And we know that it's complex, this ecosystem and this, this, this ecosystem that we're trying to do, we're, in which we're all trying to, to work together to solve some pretty complex problems. So one example this year where we kind of uh, waded in and, and um, tried to play our part uh, you know, has to do with one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest issues that has been before us all, which is the war in Ukraine. 
Um, our State Department partners asked us uh, to, to be a connection point for those philanthropic institutions who wanted to know more about how they could help. So um, we first provided a bridge between the State Department and, and philanthropy, and that discussion has continued on, and there's been some collaboration. So now we've, had, we've launched a Ukraine Peer Learning Circle uh, that kicked off in October, and that'll continue to bring members and others together on a monthly basis to strategize how to support people on the ground who are most affected by that war. So with all of our programs and service, we're, we're trying to care for you in the work that you're doing to care for your communities. And we want to be a guide, but we know that the expertise really lies with you. Um, we, we see your passion and we want to just say thank you for being what makes the council vital. Um, so this is, this is why we're always wanting to be in conversation with you so that we can understand what you need and that we can be able to be here to, um, to provide it to you. And uh, you, know, you saw from the slide that Tanya pulled up the five members of the task force that helped with the ethics uh, principles, the ethical principles that we pulled together. There are uh, hundreds of other members that have informed various parts of our work. And I just wanna say thank you to every single one of you who have served on a task force or a committee or the council's board of directors over the course of the past year, or who have raised your hand to do so in the future. Uh, we are grateful and we're going to find a spot for you uh, if we have not yet to, to lift your voice um, and to shape not only our work, but the work of philanthropy in the years ahead. So looking forward to 2023 and beyond, um, there's just some exciting work coming up that you have helped to shape. Uh, one, one bit of that is uh, work on building common ground. Uh, we have been uh, shaping that up over the course of the past couple years in conversation with many of our members who are really advanced uh, in active listening with them. And so this is so that we can build communities that are both more equitable and less divided. We're also very excited to see many of you at our leading locally conference in Denver in June. Thank you to all of the folks, both on the committees, the host and program planning committee, uh, who are shaping up that conference to be just truly excellent. Um, and finally, there's we're going to be debuting some new work on global issues, um, as well as some additional programming for CEOs with a focus on those folks who are new to their role. So all more to come. So I want to get out of the way, though, because we have um, terrific conversation to come between Charles and Brennan. Um, so before I do that, though, I have just a couple moments of gratitude that I want to express. First of all, I have to say an enormous thank you to the amazing council team. This is a staff of talented, caring people who do uh, incredible work behind the scenes and in front of the scenes for you every day. I hope you feel well served by them. Um, they are doing their level best. Uh, to, to be responsive and to be there for you. And I am grateful. And I just wanted to say that, that publicly to them. Secondly, we are here. Uh, the council board is meeting. There's a whole group of council board members in the, in the conference room in our building right now watching um, this live. And so that's exciting. And a couple of them, sadly, this is their last meeting. So I just wanted to say an enormous thank you to two board members in particular who have been long serving and incredibly dedicated leaders at the council. Randy Royster, who is from the Albuquerque Community Foundation. He's been on the board. He's been an audit committee chair. Uh, he previously served as um, a, a chair of the of Community Foundation National Standards. He has just been dedicated to the council for a lot of years and we are grateful. Uh, the other person is Jamie Mirasotis of the Lumina Foundation. And Jamie is a previous chair of the Council on Foundations, and he helped see us through um, my leadership transition and much more. And we are just um, going to miss you, and we are so grateful for your service. Finally, the, the other transition that's happening that, that was not mentioned, but the stellar and amazing board chair, Tanya Allen. This is her last board meeting as chair. 
And I think that the field all was done a disservice that Tanya Allen was chair of the Council on Foundations during a pandemic, where she was not as um, uh, in as public of a role because none of us were in as public of a role for the past couple of years, because she is an amazing leader from whom we all can learn a great deal. And I know that I have. So all of my gratitude to you, Tanya, for the two years of learning under your leadership that I have had. So with that, I now get to say a couple words about the other award winners before I hand it off um, uh, for, for some introductions um, for our next part of our, our conversation. So uh, as Tanya mentioned at the top of the call, the council is excited to host these annual awards because we recognize excellence in philanthropy. And this year we did launch a new outstanding corporate philanthropy leadership award to recognize an individual in corporate philanthropy who really is personifying um, this great work that corporate foundations and, and giving programs do. And in 2022, the award recipient was Rosita uh, Najmi. She is the head of global social innovation at PayPal. Now, Rosita exemplifies everything that the criteria laid out. She has courage and integrity. She builds trust with those that she is um, trying to work with and she is quite the leader. So her, will, her work is very much um, all for social purpose and she is um, an ethical corporate citizen and she was really working hard during the challenges in responding to the pandemic. So her leadership um, in this field really exemplifies the values of trying to operate in the best possible way um, and, and doing so in a way that is participatory and with a commitment and focus on building trusting relationships. So I just wanna say a huge congratulations to Rosita. So next, I also wanted to recognize our Scribner Award winner. Now, this is a very long-standing award that we have had. It was established in 1984. And this is um, in honor of outstanding creativity and innovation um, for an organization um, in philanthropy. So this is about having vision and principle and personal commitment and making a difference in a creative way. And so this year's recipient for the Scrivener Award is the Social Equity Collaborative Fund at Catalyst of San Diego and Imperial Counties. And I was so excited when the committee, and again, this was, this was a, a, a committee of your peers that, that um, chose these award winners. Um, when the committee chose Catalyst, because this is one of our peers, a philanthropy a regional association um, that uh, set up this fund. So the Social Equity Collaborative Fund is uh, focused on grassroots solutions that are equitable, and it's a really great model in philanthropy. And it's got an independent steering committee that has both you know, subject matter experts and folks who come from the community. And I think the, the names are, are popping up on the screen so you can see all the folks who were involved and who deserve um, credit for this terrific work. So I just wanna say congratulations to the steering committee for the wonderful team over there at Catalyst um, of San, San Diego and Imperial counties. Um, and we're just so glad to honor you with this award. And now it is my great pleasure to hand over the mic to Tara Sandercock, who is the 2021 winner of the Dis Distinguished Service Award because she has the pleasure of introducing this year's Distinguished Award Service Awardee, Tara. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm Tara Sandercock, and for 25 years, I was with the Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro. And it's a great honor to be with you here today and to introduce our 2022 Distinguished Service Award recipient, Charles Anderson. Charlie is Chair Emeritus of the San Juan Island Community Foundation in the great state of Washington. The nomination package that was prepared for Charlie was filled with great information, but there are two amazing sentences that I want to pull out and share with you today. He embodies the head, heart, and hands of the Council's award honorees through his knowledge, 
and awareness of community needs, his gravitas and charisma drawing capable people to a cause, and his indefatigable pursuit of entrepreneurial solutions to achieve desired results. This ambition is balanced by his humility and his deep concern for all people. Charlie is a scientist, a researcher, a businessman, a, a teacher, a community builder, and a philanthropist. He came to his profession through education at MIT and then earned his PhD in physiology and molecular biophysics from the University of Washington. In 1976, he founded Cogent Data Technologies, a successful computer hardware networking company headquartered in Friday Harbor, Washington with offices around the world. He then sold the company in 1996 and retired. Since then, I would say that Charlie has found his second career, or perhaps I should say his second calling in philanthropy and community building. I'll let him tell you how he came to find the foundation, but indeed a perfect match was made. He quickly moved into leadership roles and guided the foundation through many initiatives and the development of the organization. He served as the foundation's chair for 12 years and during his tenure, annual grants to the community grew 50 fold, that's 5-0. Charles was the founding chair of the Peace Island Medical Center, and through the Community Foundation, he co-directed the capital campaign to improve access to health care for Islanders. The Cancer Care Center is named after his former wife, Deanna, whose passing served as an inspiration to create the hospital. When I interviewed Charlie, I quickly understood that he appreciates the power of philanthropy in the many ways that foundations can lead and catalyze for good. He embraces the value of convening, involving nonprofits, donors, and other stakeholders to ascertain needs and craft solutions together. Today, we are so fortunate to be treated to what I know will be an inspiring conversation. I invite you to listen for his personal story at the heart of his work and how out of tragedy, one can build a legacy for the community. Charlie is here along with Brennan Gold, President and CEO of the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation, and as has been mentioned, is a member of the Board of the Council. Please join me in welcoming Brennan and Charlie. Thank you, Tara, so much. Um, and hi, Charles, it's wonderful to see you. I wanna first say uh, just congratulations on the Distinguished Service Award. It's uh, truly an honor. And as I've gotten to know you and hear your story, it is so well-deserved and it's it's very evident. And I'm really glad that um, the, the field is gonna to get to hear your story. It's a really important one. So um, I've uh, got a few questions for you and I look forward to just um, having this conversation. I want to um, also just say thank you, Tara, for the, the um, comments that you shared from the application package, because I know you've chatted with Charles. I've chatted with Charles. You and I, Tara, have not coordinated, but we both walked away with the same um, experience of you, Charles, and um, and 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 just um, you've left the impression on both of us of your uh, visionary, um, you know, kind of approach to things, as well as your entrepreneurial spirit and your care. Um, I know you and I have only gotten to know each other through a few conversations, um, but one thing that I've noticed about you, Charles, is your passion for making a difference and your ability to see what's possible. And uh, it's so evident that you have cared about, cared for, cared with your community for so many years. And, uh, and you've done that both as a business owner, a philanthropist, and a volunteer. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about um, how you got to, to, to into philanthropy, but also um, connected with the San Juan Island Community Foundation. Um, there's much in your story that those of us who lead small and mid-sized community foundations will find very familiar. Um, and so tell us a little bit about how you got involved. Well, thank you, Brennan, and thank you, Tara. Uh, Tara, that was an uh, a introduction that goes beyond uh, wonderful, but I thank you. And, uh, and Brennan, yes, we've only recently met uh, on Zoom, but we've had some great conversations. 
But I, I have to start by saying that while I am completely humbled by this, this award is really in my name, but represents the work of so many people, so many uh, wonderfully spirited members of our community, philanthropists, members of our board of directors at the Salmon Island Community Foundation, the staff, and, and through that collective work has led to some great results. And so when I accept this award, it's really in the name of so many other people. Um, yeah, to my introduction to, to philanthropy was not through being in the field. I did not learn uh, uh, the methods of philanthropy. In fact, I barely knew what a community foundation was. And, excuse me, and so, um, and, and it was really through tragedy, personal tragedy, that led me to even understand the power of community foundations. My, as was already referred to, my wife died of cancer, colon cancer, Throw, throwing my phone across the room because it won't stop ringing. Um, and so I, um, uh, when she died, I uh, was completely devastated. I essentially hid under the mattress for a year. And in, in her honor, um, uh, she died of colon cancer after a three year effort. She, um, she was a, a spirit that I had met at MIT. We were both engineers. And I decided that I would form a scholarship or fellowship for young women entering the fields of science, engineering, and technology. And so what did I do? I'm from the Northwest. And so I immediately called up the Seattle Foundation, which I had heard of and said, oh, I would like to start this fund. And they said, great, we'd love to do that. But they said, uh, but you know, you have a community foundation in your own community in Friday Harbor, Washington, which is a very small island-based community, remote, 6,000 population. And I said, I had no clue. And the truth is, I really didn't have a clue because the foundation at that point was a P.O. box that was emptied once a week, no telephone number, and no office, and no staff. So I got to meet the people that were involved, and I realized that this was a compassionate, wonderful collection of people that really understood the importance of community and how one can help and build a community. And so I opened the, the, the scholarship through the local community foundation, and that was my first introduction. But as you all have probably had similar experiences, after a month, they called me up and said, oh, and by the way, would you like to be on the board of directors of the community foundation? And I thought about it and eventually said, yes, not, sure, not really sure what I was getting into. And... Of course, three months after that, the next question came, which was, oh, and by the way, wouldn't you like to be chair of the board of the Community Foundation? And so that's how I got into this. But I realized through that process and over the years, the Community Foundations are really very special nonprofits. Not only are they umbrellas for lots of special interest nonprofits in our communities, but they have the power to really see the big picture in a community, to pull the pieces together and to make fundamental differences and fundamental changes on some very large scale projects. So it was out of the tragedy of the loss of my first wife um, that I was able to enter this field and hopefully do some good um, through it all. So thank you for the question. Yeah, well, and Charles and I, I think you did more than just some good. You did, you've had quite a legacy in your community um, because you did say yes. You said yes to um, joining the board and, and then to chairing and, uh, and then to really meeting some of the challenges before your community. And you mentioned that, you know, community foundations are special. They, community foundations and place-based funders are uniquely positioned to understand the complex and dynamic needs that are facing local communities. And they also have this convening superpower, which is really awesome and when wielded well, um, can really bring about transformative solutions 
solutions, as you said. And I would love for you to talk about the critical access hospital that um, that was built in your remote island. Um, I, I know you personally had experiences about the, the 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 gap that not having a hospital was creating and some of the challenges for families uh, seeking health care and how um, your vision and your partnership across the community really brought about a really transformative solution. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? Yeah, I'd love to. So also out of the tragedy of losing my first wife, uh, the realization of the inadequacy of rural health care, particularly in an island environment where it's a two hour ferry ride to even get to the mainland, uh, a small clinic, great doctors, but very limited services, almost no equipment. And so treating things like uh, cancer was just out of the question. And so Luckily, through my company, we had some resources and we were able to travel to MD Anderson in Texas and to Sloan Kettering in New York and other large hospitals to try and get the best of the best care. But ultimately, when it came down to it, a person with a chronic illness really needs to be at home. That's where the healing happens. That's where their life is. And so I realized that traveling to healthcare wasn't sufficient. We had to bring healthcare to the island. And so through a friend who called me up and said, have you ever heard of a critical access hospital? Of course I had not. I hadn't heard of a community foundation, much less a critical access hospital. And so, uh, but what I learned was that this is a special class of medical services that allows big hospital approaches in very small rural communities. And a funny story is when we applied to the state for the license to open the hospital after raising a bunch of funds to build, to, to uh, buy some property and hire an architect, and we did a formal application, uh, I went in, it was a big fat piece of paper, a, a booklet of paper, and, and I got a telephone call from the state auditor, the healthcare auditor, and said, the application looks great. We're going to meet on it. Well, it'll take us six months to review it. But the only one problem, you have made a mistake on the first page. And I said, what? I mean, that's really embarrassing. And so he said, yeah, um, you left off a zero. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, this just says it's for 10 bed hospital. The smallest we've ever done is a hundred bed hospital. Well, no, we meant a 10 bed hospital. And I'll tell you 10 beds in a small community are like a hundred in a large community. And so we're very proud to have been able to put the hospital project together completely based on philanthropic efforts. There was no tax dollars in the purchase of the property, the design or construction of the physical building. There was some subsequent tax money for additional services but the whole hospital was built on philanthropy. And that was very empowering to us, to the community and to those donors and made a huge difference in the quality of life of living on a remote island. Yeah, wow, it's just amazing. It's so amazing and I think about how your leadership and the work of, with the Community Foundation was making place and uh, really building out um, uh, amenities. And, and I think the other thing I, I want you, I'm going to prompt you to tell the other part of that, which is um, the award that the hospital received uh, in 2012. Can you share with us um, what that was? Well, we're, yeah, we're very proud. We did two things on the hospital design. One is um, we were really sensitive about the environment. And so the whole hospital was designed to be as eco-friendly as possible. It has deep well heat pumps to provide energy for the thing. All the wood that's used for beams, floors, stairs for, are from trees that we had to cut down under the footprint of the hospital building. And we saved those and had them milled up locally and dried and used for, our, for our stuff. But the real issue was that being so remote, we had to adopt some of the highest tech that you can have in healthcare. And in 2012, we were fully online. And by doing that, combining a warm, almost lodge-like atmosphere with a super high-tech solution in order to get services out on the island, um, we 
we came up with a combination that the American Institute of Architects awarded us the best hospital in all of North America, Canada, and um, the U.S. for the year 2012. And we're very proud of that. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I love, too, that it's, it's a really beautiful lesson about equity and that when we are centering the, the needs and experiences of those who are most marginalized and excluded, in this case, deeply remote, you know, um, that, that we actually find solutions that work better for everyone. And, and so I really love that about your experience. Um, I want to unpack a little bit more about that journey because this was a multi-year, multi-million dollar, multi-sector, multi-partner project um, that required people with different points of view and different um, expectations and priorities to come together to find a way to, to have trust with one another and to build common ground. And I would love for you to share a little bit about that experience and some of the lessons learned that you had uh, going through that. Well, it would be naive to say that it went all smooth sailing and that everybody instantaneously loved the project. If you lived, I mean, I'm sure in big communities, but if you lived in a small community, everybody knows everybody else's business and any new idea is met with instantaneous, oh, that can't work. And so we had to uh, introduce the project in some new and unusual ways, at least for us. We were able to um, convene lots of conversations with the community. We gave, instead of lecturing the community about what we're doing, we let the community talk to itself in a round table, more round table type format. So everybody's feelings were, whether they were positive or negative, felt that they were being respected, that they had a platform in which to express their ideas. We did change some people's ideas. I don't think everybody's ideas, but at least we got accommodation. We got respect from the community that, okay, you know, this isn't costing us tax dollars, although most people didn't really believe that. And so they, they said, okay, we're willing to try it. And the truth is that after a number of years of operation, it really has proven itself such that so many people in the community that were naysayers before have now come around and are at active advocates of the hospital. So yeah, community com conversations, not so easy along the way, probably the hardest part of the project, but one of the most rewarding in the end. Yeah, that's outstanding. And I think just speaks to how much um, being able to bring people together, being able to find common ground and build trust is so critical to the, uh, the, the really maximizing the impact of our philanthropic work. So I, I really appreciate that part of the story. Um, I would love, just as we wrap up here, um, for you to just share a few of your key reflections from your many years and also what you see for the future, some of the opportunities and, um, and uh, potential. Well, I think the big lesson that I've learned is that um, the community foundations are unique beasts in our communities. I have full respect and we service the nonprofits and each nonprofit has a wonderful calling, but often they're siloed to particular areas of interest. And the power of a community foundation is that it can both service those individual nonprofits but can also see the bigger picture. It can take an integrative approach, both in determining the needs uh, and also the solutions. It can pull nonprofits together to actually cooperate and pull different pieces together. And the hospital was a perfect example where it wasn't just figuring out about medical care and architecture and all that. It was also understanding childcare for the workers, recruitment of the workforce, workforce housing and affordable housing for workforce affordable housing. So it pulls together so many different aspects of the needs of communities into one package. And so that's what community foundations are really uh, extra specially uh, positioned to do is to look at the big picture and come up with more comprehensive solutions. And so for the future, well, it's more of that. We're embarking on a, a new library project as we speak, which we're all very excited about um, and helping the, the library raise funds for a new, a brand new library. Also, of course, with a lot of high tech aspects to it. 
And I think that one of the things that I personally take away uh, is that it has been such a pleasure to be able to work with people of strong ethical commitment. Mm -hmm. Ethics is really so important. And I noticed that in the Council on Foundations group, having a, a ethical underpinning, being able to stick to that, to understand it, as it's been said to me in the past that we do ethical discernments on many of the projects because it is naive to believe that everything is just great about every project. There's positives, there's negatives, and you really have to elucidate all of those in order to understand whether a project should even go forward. And so that's my real personal pleasure is working with others who feel that same way. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Charles. Um, for all who are listening, I hope that you were just enriched in the ways that I've been um, really getting to know Charles's story. So congratulations again on your award. Thank you. Thank you, um, Brennan, and thank you, Tara, for introducing us to our newest uh, Distinguished Service Awardee, Charles. You are so inspiring, and we're just so grateful to have you doing such good work in your community and representing the field of philanthropy. So I just want to say thank you to that. I know our members are inspired by you, and I hope that our members were also inspired by our president and CEO, Kathleen uh, Enright, as she articulated the progress that the council has made as well as our intentions um, for new programming, new ways that we hope to lead in the coming year. Uh, one of the things that I am grateful about the council is that if our programming and our approach is so multifaceted. Uh, we have been able to do responsive work. Basically, that means that we've listened to the needs of our members and delivered what you've asked for. And then we've also done lots of proactive things as well, which is about finding both our ambitions as well as gaps in our sector and proactively identifying solutions and programming to make sure that you don't even know that they exist. And then finally, um, that reparative work that we aim to do, which is making sure that we're keeping our eyes on the macro issues and the system impacts within our society that really need to be reformed and for, in order for all of us to um, uh, just really uh, fully meet our own aspirations and ambitions across uh, this globe. And so I'm just really grateful for that work. And then finally, I just wanted to say, it's been really a great pleasure and privilege to be able to serve the council, all of the members as your uh, chair on the Council on Foundations. As you all know, it has been, um, I've been able to do that through the leadership of our board of directors and um, the fantastic and talented and dedicated staff of the Council on Foundations. Um, one last thing I would just say, Kathleen said it, it was a shame that I was uh, <laughs> served as chair during the pandemic. And actually, I think it, it, of it as a great privilege. When we are in our darkest times, that's when we must lead. And I felt very privileged that so many people entrusted me with that privilege to work alongside Kathleen and all of her talented team members to serve our community, to make sure that our philanthropic sector is stronger and better as a result of it. So with that, I... Um, well, thank you very much. And then also, of course, um, look forward to supporting our incoming chair, Peter Lawhern. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.